Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar on opportunity framing. My name's Robert Allen. I'm APM Branches Manager, and I'll be your host for this evening. I'm delighted that Carl is joining us to share his knowledge on such a key area. I'd personally like to say thank you to the volunteers of the APM branches, and in this case, the APM Northwest Branch Cumbria chapter, for all their energy and their achievements with the webinars over the past year and a half and going forward. Today's event will count towards your CPD, so please find additional information in the handout section where you can reflect on the knowledge that you've learned tonight. We're also keen to get your involvement, so please feel free to submit your questions via your control panel. Um, I'll try and interrupt during today's presentation to submit these questions. If not, I'll put them to Cole at the end of the session. We're also using Slido tonight, so get your phone ready to zap a QR code to get in there or have another web browser open. Uh, halfway through the slide, we'll be putting some polls to you and also towards the end. We're really keen to get your involvement um, and understand more about yourselves. Um, so you're not here to listen to me, you're here to listen to Cole, and I'm delighted that Cole, um, Head of Cross Industrial Learning at NDA, is here to help us. So Cole, over to you. Well, thank you very much. I am uh, very glad to be here and I hope my voice uh, holds out. <coughs> Excuse me, I might have to do that a few times. I'll just introduce myself in a bit more detail. I'm the head of cross industry learning at the UK's Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, which is a non-departmental body reporting to Bayes. We have the whole of the UK's nuclear, civil nuclear decommissioning scope uh, within our, our purview. But I'm not here to talk about the NDA today. I'm here to talk about a process called opportunity framing, uh, which, which we're introducing. I know a lot about opportunity framing because I picked it up in a previous life. As you can see there, I worked before I came into the uh, public sector uh, in the private sector my whole career, uh, in particular with some of the international oil companies uh, that you see on the slide there. Uh, for, for a good uh, 10 to 15 years. Prior to that, a lot of management consultancy background. I'm a projects person, basically, so I know a lot about project maturation, uh, whether they're IT projects that I used to do or they're the massive mega projects, the industrial infrastructure projects that, that I'm engaged with uh, now. And I'm very pleased to talk about opportunity framing, something I've been doing for about 15 years now, and, and we're uh, adopting uh, across the UK government. Uh, and I hope you'll like it by the time you've heard about it. This is what was in the flyer. It's the premise of the, the webinar. Uh, the basic premise is that uh, root cause of project failure, and I'm sure we all have experienced project failures, can be poor upfront shaping, amongst other things. And facilitated opportunity framing uh, is designed to help with upfront shaping. It's particularly useful at project inception, but it is a process which can be repeated, perhaps ought to be repeated, is what I will advocate today, throughout front-end uh, loading. Uh, it's uh, really a tool for optioneering or decisioneering or whatever your favorite term for, for that thing is. It's being rolled out across the UK's major projects portfolio right now by the Infrastructure and Projects Authority, which I'll call the IPA, here on after, and also by ourselves, where we're rolling it out in uh, to many more projects uh, than just our GMPP projects here at the, the NDA. Uh, by the time we finish this talk, you will hopefully agree with me that framing makes uh, the project outcomes more predictable. I think you'll also see how it encourages uh, the aligning of stakeholders around what the project's there to do. Uh, and uh, you'll see what it adds uh, to the common to the tool sets we already have deployed, uh, but there are some bits missing, and this f fills those missing uh, pieces. I'll tell you about who can do this uh, and how you can get uh, involved, and wider uses of framing outside of just the pure the pure project uh, space. So let's start with uh, what failure looks like. This is one of my graphics. Uh, uh, based on my personal experience, it's extracted from a paper we jointly wrote, the NDA, with Oranon, our French, uh, if you like, sister company who's in the same business, when we were looking at project failure and trying to figure out what was going wrong. On the right-hand side, uh, uh, there's a, a hypothesis, a thesis, if you like, uh, that optimism bias in cost, schedule, and indeed uh, scope uh, estimation uh, that's a problem. So we're deploying a lot of tools in the NDA 
uh, to address optimism bias. Uh, uh, what we have not been doing so much today to the NDA is addressing the other side of the root cause of failure, which is poor shaping. Framing is very much aimed as a tool which helps holistically on this left-hand side, but it also happens to help out quite a lot on the right-hand side too. It's a very holistic tool uh, aimed to uh, essentially address uh, most, if not all, of the risks of project failure if, if done well. And I'll come back to this slide uh, to, to show how, how uh, see if you agree with me at the end. Now, the size of the prize, uh, what is this going to do for us? Uh, it improves the, product, the, the predictability of, of cost, schedule, uh, and scope. Uh, if you look on a global basis, look at the graphic at the top right. This is um, one of Ed Merrow's pictures, uh, Ed Merrow of the IPA Global Inc. Uh, variety, that benchmarking uh, and PDRI outfit that many of us will know and love. It shows how uh, in his global database projects can go awry and that when they do go awry, particularly the mega projects, they go, the cost can grow by 30 percent, the schedule can slip by 30 to 40 percent, those kind of numbers and schedule that can be production of problems of a significant variety uh, too. So quite a lot of global experience, as everyone on this call will be familiar with, with what project failure looks like and what that means in terms of cost and schedule overruns. Um, what this, what you audience might not know is how bad it is in civil nuclear. Uh, there was some work done which we at the NDA have corroborated by uh, Oxford Global Projects which tended to suggest that the average cost overrun in civil nuclear was three times the original estimated cost and twice the schedule. And that is a whole lot worse than the kind of global industrial benchmark at the top right. And like I say, we've, we've corroborated those numbers and we have examples which are as bad as that, if not worse than that uh, in the NDA's estate. And that is the problem that we are trying to fix. If you zoom in from the global view into the UK government view, uh, part of the reason for that uh, is evident from this, this graphic here, which is um, a slide showing the delivery confidence uh, assessments from green is good to red is, is bad, number somewhere in between, of the government's major projects portfolio uh, as of uh, a, few, a, little, a little time ago, and the amount of value of those projects that was involved. Now, there's not a lot of green in that chart. So I think you can tell, if you didn't already know, that a lot of government projects are going to go wrong, they're not being very well shaped, and they're going to end up being a lot worse than we see at the top right there. And framing is aimed <clears throat> as a process at the governmental level of trying to stop that happening, and it will succeed. Now, here is a view of what civil nuclear can look like when it goes really bad. Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly slide. At the bottom right here, you can see what bad looks like. What you're looking at is a range of estimates here, at project exception, a base estimate, a P10, a 50, and an 80, which is a fairly narrow range. This cartoon, it is a cartoon, but it is based on a real project that the National Audit Office looked at that we completed at one of our facilities. Real narrow range of project inception. That uh, surprise, surprise, at the next stage gate, when the next business case, the SOC business case was presented, had a different range, which was completely to the right. And as, as, as the project matured and each business case was represented for sanction, the, the, it was always moving to the right. No range over overlapped with any earlier range. And at the end of the project, the actual to date was way outside any of the original expectations. We all know that's wrong. That particular project ended up 10 times the original cost and roughly a decade late. Uh, what good should look like, and this is at the top left, as we project practitioners know full well, is that it should have more of a funnel shape. A very wide range of estimates at the start, gradually narrowing until the actual outcome is somewhere within the, uh, the, the, original, the original range. Uh, the cost estimation, the optimism bias tools that I talked about earlier, they're aimed at solving this problem, but framing is aimed at solving this problem too, by giving a wide range of options at the start and, and a, good, a good chance of the outcome coming within the original range. <clears throat> now, this is what we call the Eagle's Big Diagram, something you may be familiar with. It shows the value of front-end uh, loading. 
Um, the, uh, in the early stages of a project's maturation up to, um, and then up to FID, final investment decision, or FBC, final business case in governmental terms, that is where the value of a project is mostly added. Uh, or if the opportunity to add value is lost, it's where the value is not added. The value in execution or in operations can only really be maintained once it's been added through uh, the front end loading can be eroded a little bit. So, you know, the opportunity to create value uh, in any space, but particularly the government space, is recognized as being here at the front end. And framing is designed to be a tool to be applied at three particular points. Firstly, here, a project inception, uh, in order to give you the tools to help generate the long list of alternatives, that real divergent thinking you're looking for in the initial stages, but also the tools to narrow that long list down to a short list, and then to move, then for framing to be done again around that short listing, uh, to uh, narrow that short list down to a single concept selection at about outline business case, OBC or single concept select stage gate as it might be called in other in other industries so framing to be used at least at the start and then again at these gates that's what i meant about the repeated application of the process oops sorry skipped a slide there now why do we think framing is going to work in government well uh, here is a slide i once put together for a, a variety of oil companies um, and it shows the similarity between most of the project maturation processes that are in use between a lot of the majors, the names you'll recognize on the left-hand side there. Now down at the bottom is the NDAs process. Fundamentally, what we require in a green book compliant business case at SOC, OBC and FBC lines up to what is really going on in oil and gas. So knowing as I do that framing is a process that works very well in and across oil and gas between the majors, I am very confident that it can be mapped. I was very confident when I first thought of the idea of introducing it into the NDA that it could map across and be useful in our space. And that has proved correct. Um, there's a lot of proprietary approaches out there to framing. It's not just us doing it. It was invented by Big Pharma uh, in the last century. It was adopted by Big Oil and Gas in uh, the 80s and the 90s. It's picked up by large consultancies, it was picked up by boutique consultancies. Some of the names are on the list. And it was adopted by uh, engineering houses uh, like KBR. And I mentioned some of these names because these are some of the people involved with the IPA's initiative uh, and, and our estate. Now, this is the government's view. This is not my graphic. The other one was my graphic. This one is IPA's graphic. It pretty much says the same thing. Uh, the whole graphic itself is pinched from a guy who first drew it back in the 80s, uh, back in, in Chevron. Uh, but we now all, all live by, by this, by this uh, mantra. Uh, and uh, this is a graphic from the IPA's framing guide. About a year ago, there was a working group put together by the IPA to devise a method, a guide, and a tool set for opportunity framing adapted uh, from oil and gas and from other industries. Uh, and I was part of that working group, and that guide now exists, and it shows uh, the the val and, and 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 it has many of the messages that I'm about to outline today. Uh, at the moment, that guide is proprietary; you can't go and look at it unless you work like me for part of the government. Uh, it is only at the moment for HM government use, and it is indeed not yet issued for use because it's still being drafted and piloted across the government's estates. And it's intended to be used by the IPA for, as I said earlier, the GMPP uh, project uh, portfolio. This is what the process looks like in the guide. It's a three-step process, uh, allowing a project team and stakeholders to align on where they are, where they want to be, and how to get there in a series uh, of uh, steps. The output of the process is, a, is written, it is succinct, and it is usually edited <clears throat> collectively by the people who produced it so that there is no doubt about the unanimity of the people who uh, participated uh, in, in, in what the, uh, the output uh, is and what it says. Now, here's another view of the same thing, a little bit more simply. Uh, it shows the elements of the frame. 
essentially each of the uh, cells in this table is uh, a piece of the frame. We usually do the whole thing in a framing exercise over two days, although sometimes uh, we will skip uh, a few steps or, or make some lighter uh, or, or, um, or heavier. And if you want to see a good description, by the way, of, uh, of, of, of what these things are and why they are and why they are in the order that they are, have a look at some of the papers uh, that people like me and others have have written on the subject, which are always referenced down the bottom of these slides, and these slides are going to be available uh, after this meeting. Now, um, why do you do framing three times? Uh, is it not always going to be the same thing? Well, yes and no. There are some aspects of this frame, these things down the left-hand side, which are generally stable between the stages. Um, you wouldn't expect them to change. You'd be in big trouble in fact if things like the scope was wobbling uh, from stage to stage but there are some aspects of the the uh, frame which are completely different uh, between the stage stages as, as so for example the givens which might be a short list of things that are given uh, facts on the ground at the start of a project will get longer as you go through decision gates decisions get made and the givens are incremented the strategic decisions that framing outlines during each stage pertain to that stage. So the strategic decisions that you'll need to make by SOC will be one set, then you'll make them, move on, they'll become givens. Then for the next stage to get to OBC, or single concept select stage, you'll need to make a completely different set of strategic decisions, the next set, and so on. And of course, the decision logic and sequencing of those decisions will change between stages. So doing framing again at SOC and OBC stage is not about redoing what was done earlier because a lot of it remains stable. It's about inventing these, these new incremental steps that pertain to the next stage. Of course, other things like risks, well, some of those get mitigated, opportunities get banked, uncertainties get narrowed, uh, and so on. So there are other elements of the frame which require a fresh lick of paint at each stage gate. That's why we do it again. Now, what are the framing pilots we've done in the NDA estates so far? Well, the slide only goes up to October, but uh, we did about, uh, well, we did six pilots. Uh, haven't put the names on the slide to keep the anonymity, but you can see a variety of different program project types there, even policy formulation or strategy formulation in the last one that we did. They're across a variety of diff business units. Some of them were face-to-face, -face, some of them were virtual. And of course, we were toying with different opportunity framing processes that went through. Uh, when we started off, I didn't have the EY one, so I just used my own. Uh, and then uh, as the EY and IPA one became available, we began to use it, and then we began to adapt it to the NDA's purposes. We are still piloting at the NDA. There's still a bunch of things that we have uh, underway at the bottom here, across various, various different business units, and the, uh, uh, and the IPA are piloting this across a variety of government departments and different project types, including IT, defense, healthcare, prisons, you, you name it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the, the, there's the diff I did mention that we're doing things slightly different from the uh, uh, IPA. It's, it's not hugely different. I mean, we're using 90% of the IPA's framing guide verbatim, but it is a fact that they are focused on mainly projects at inception, and a lot of our projects are already in flight. So we're applying uh, framing to projects in flight at SOC and OBC gates as well as, as projects at inception. Um, uh, just to, I'm not going to read the whole thing here. They're obviously focused on GMPP projects and we have a much wider uh, scope of applicability. We'll probably be doing 40 framing events per year in the NDA, which is probably more than the IPA will be doing uh, put together across all of all of UK uh, government. So there are, there are some differences and we're going to roll out a training course uh, to bring our uh, pool of um, facilitators up to a suitably qualified and experienced professional level, practitioner level. Uh, so, uh, so, so our NDA training, specific training will be available in a few months. The IPA's training's already been out there and used uh, a few times. Now, in choosing the NDA's approach to framing, 
we it, it wasn't just this is framing slap the puppy in um, that we did we did have choices and the strategy table of choices is up at the top right here but you know when it came to things like periodicity how often does one do framing does one only do it at the start does one do it again does then one do it again um, they, these are choices and we uh, thought long and hard about whether we should do a minimalist or a maximalist approach there are questions as to whether you should do framing before during or after a gate whether or not it should be mandatory, who facilitates it. You know, we came down on the idea that it needed to be trained facilitators rather than self-facilitation by project team. So we actually applied the process of framing to the project, which was to roll out framing at the NDA and made choices. And this was really the outcome uh, and the particular set of choices uh, we made other companies may choose to make do other approaches, but this we felt was suitable for, for the NDA. I wanted to show you an example of uh, one of the uh, tools of framing. This is a strategy table. That's not really a framing tool. I mean, strategy table is an industry standard thing, but not all people are familiar with it. Um, but uh, what you can see here, and it's, it's a worked example from the frame for framing and these are the uh, and what it shows each column is a decision that a project needs to make and this is my framing project these are the decisions i need to make before i finish the file the pilot stage and underneath each column heading there is an option i could do a b or c or i could do a or b and so on and there are various strategies i could take through trying to achieve some behavioral change initiative across the state versus just a targeted facilitation. You know, that as we go down the list, these get more ambitious, if you like. And threaded through this is the one that we actually picked. So on the previous slide, I showed you the, 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 the things that we'd actually decided to do from among the alternatives. And what I'm showing you here is an example of, of, a, of one slide from a frame uh, and what it does. It crystallizes and makes really clear what decisions the project's going to make, what options it should consider, what options it should not consider and outline some of the potential strategies that might bring different groups of decisions together uh, for analysis. Uh, the other thing I can show you is how that strategy table then leads to decision support documentation. So this is, um, these are the value drivers from the frame for framing. And these are those strategies that I outlined on the strategy table. And this colored in a very simple uh, form is uh, to what extent do each of these uh, uh, strategies that we could take flatter the value drivers we think we're trying to achieve by, by choosing an opportunity framing approach. So this just shows you how a framing product in terms of a strategy table and value drivers can then be translated into something which later appears in a business case to justify a decision. And essentially that's what framing's for. It's done at the start of the stage in order to give you the tools to, at the end of the stage, write a very cohesive and well-argued and well-justified, well-underpinned business case. Some of the other uh, nuances of framing, here's a, a real example, albeit genericized, so you can see, can't see where it's from, of a decision logic, right? So each blue box on here is the column heading uh, from a table, from a strategy table, a decision that needed to be made by a particular project. This is an oil and gas upstream uh, decommissioning slash repurposing uh, project. Uh, and what you can see here is that it's quite complicated. <laughs> you know, decisions are not to be made in a single order. They're not all to be made at once. They're made in a particular order. And there are ways in which the decisions come together in certain ways before the actual stage gate to suggest that perhaps there's some assurance which needs to be done around that group of decisions rather than waiting for assurance to be left all the way to, to, to the end of the stage. Now, uh, th it, that particular project, just to ram home the point of why you do framing at each gate, had a different set of decisions and a different uh, decision sequence to be made for the defined stage, compare and contrast, select stage, top left, uh, defined stage, uh, bottom right. So that just shows you why it's important to do framing each stage because this diagram is completely different each time. Now just where does framing fit in? 
uh, framing, if, if done at the start of the stage, it is essentially a step that then enables the creation of an integrated and assurance and approvals plan, um, which then, of course, leads to a set of assurance, which builds up to a business case, another gate, and then framing's done again. Framing is not a piece of assurance, but it certainly does enable a good IAP to be written and therefore good assurance to be done. Now, I, I, I'm going to pause now and just ask uh, for, uh, for, for the chair to come and, and put a couple of poll questions to the audience. Perfect. Thank you, Carl. Uh, hopefully everyone on screen can see. Yeah, I can see a couple of people have got involved already. Um, I would recommend getting out your phone, getting a camera up and, and taking a photo of the QR code and that will get you into the Slido account. If not, you can go to slido.com and put in the uh, event code APM frame. Uh, we're really keen to see your answers. Now, I know we've got over well over 100 people on this event tonight, so I'm going to leave it to run for a little bit longer. I can see about 20 odd people are with us so far. So, Cole, I know, I know you can see the results coming yeah, in it's, live. It, it's, it's not unusual. I was expecting most people uh, for it to be new, new to them, which is great news because there's a lot of scope for improvement uh, and adding value by applying the process. But it's also good to see that some people have, um, have some experience in the recent or the uh, distant past and if they don't mind uh, I'd be very happy for people who have experience of framing to reach out to me privately after this meeting and perhaps uh, we can share some war stories and get them involved in what we're doing at governmental level please feel free to do that excellent um, so I can see 60 plus people have responded so I'll just move on to the, the next question uh, this will be our final question of this section uh, but if you're familiar with OF in which industry sector? Yeah, so if, if, if you applied your framing in oil and gas, uh, midstream, upstream, downstream, let me know if it was defense, aerospace, healthcare, whatever, just put down the industry sector. Um, I'd be uh, particularly interested in, in hearing from opportunity framing applied in industries that I wasn't aware that it was going on in yet. So we're seeing oil a lot of gas. nuclear, oil and gas. Yeah. Rail, that's, that's a new one. Again, obviously, this uh, requires a bit of typing, so I'm going to leave this one open for a little bit longer, Carl, if you don't mind. Um, Thank you. So, some more coming through. Defence, uh, local authority, uh, pharmaceutical, another one for nuclear, another one for not applicable. Government. All right, so quite widely used. Excellent. So I'll give you permission back to share your screen. Thank you. So can I just check, are you now looking at my NDA scope of implementation slide? Correct. Okay, so um, this slide and all the preceding slides uh, are going to be in the, the deck I'll make available. In a minute, I'll go through some of the uh, projects that we've done and I'll show you some real frames. They won't be in the pack that I'm distributing because they're uh, obviously a little bit confidential and the ones I'm going to show you in this video now uh, are, are so small you won't be able to read them and there's some redactions for the bits you can read uh, but I'm happy to show you kind of what they look like. But just to say on this slide uh, we did uh, have a view that uh, we would not apply framing to things like plant turnarounds, ops and maintenance and, and things like that, but we would pretty much apply it, uh, framing to everything else, not just GMPP projects that IPA are focusing on, but our major capital uh, project uh, portfolio. Uh, by the way, we've got about mm, three, four, maybe five uh, GMPP projects and they range in scale from um, you know, tens of billions like the GDF, a geological disposal facility to a few billion uh, for some of the projects at, uh, at Sellafield. But we have a lot of projects that are more of the uh, several hundred million approaching a billion variety. So uh, those ones require central sanction and we'll definitely be framing uh, those. That's why the number really goes up for what we're trying to do. But we will also apply framing to things that are not capital projects. We've already applied it to strategic decision making, 
and, and found that it works even policy formulation. We know it'll work for small to medium projects too. It's just a question of whether it's worth the effort and it usually is. We, we also think it will work for major or strategic procurements. Uh, uh, we haven't done one of those yet, but I've got one in the pipelines and other things. We've used it obviously to, as, a, as a framing uh, for the framing frame for framing uh, project. We think it'll work for corporate restructuring decisions, and we have certain beacon projects which are more of a, a cross-group logical variety without uh, capital associated. We think it'll work for those two. Now let me just show you a few examples. Here's one I made earlier. <clears throat> so this, this slide's interesting because I, I, I'm showing on the left-hand side a frame that I drafted of one of our projects that had just been through a stage gate. So it had some signed off uh, business documentation and it had sanction. It's a big one and it will remain nameless. Uh, but as you can see, the, the documentation that was available that was frame-like that I was able to pre-populate the frame with had a lot of gaps. There was none of this, no value drivers, very little decision option space, very little decision uh, sequencing, no opportunities to speak of, and so on. So some big gaps. So we went through a framing exercise, and it was one of the first ones we did, and we did wonder, is it going to add any value? Well, it did. It did in two ways. First of all, it filled in the gaps. So it gave tools to the project team that they didn't already have, and perhaps should have had going through the stage gate. But I think more to the point, it changed a lot of things. So that's slide number six uh, is a scope slide. You can see, without looking at the detail, this, the slide at the right is different. So even though people thought that the scope was nailed down, and indeed it had just gone through a sanction point, when you actually got the stakeholders together to discuss it, they argued about it for two hours until they agreed on what the scope really needed to be. So it was an exercise not just in filling in gaps, but an exercise in achieving uh, stakeholder uh, uh, alignment. So that was a really good proof of concept. Some other example frames. The, this is a frame uh, from which I extracted those, uh, those logic diagrams earlier. This is a frame for an oil and gas decommissioning project in the North Sea. It was actually a decommissioning slash repurposing project. That's why those slides were particularly uh, complicated. And I would advocate actually that in the decommissioning space where you don't have a do nothing option and you often have a variety of repurposing options, framing is particularly important, even more important than in the new build space because these charts are so complicated and because there are so many off ramps from what you might consider the normal concept selection narrowing. Uh, so anyway, this is what the frame looks like. It, that was a $3 billion project. As you can see the frame, it's not war and peace. It's not 500 pages. It's, it's just a few slides. It's really concise. But what it does lead to, and that's why I wanted to show you this in this context, it leads you to be able to produce an IAP. This is what an, an integrated assurance and approvals plan looks like to me, Carl Sanderson. It's not a single pager. A lot of people would argue an IAP looks like this like slide 21 or an IAP looks like this. It's just a list of events uh, and so on. But an IAP is more a thorough governance document on why and how you're going to assure and approve something. And this particular IAP is very shaped, as you can see on slide 18, by the frame. The assurance is designed to be uh, performed at the point at which the decision sequence is saying assurance needs to be performed rather than just at the end, uh, which is the, the normal default option. So th this is just to say that the framing really does enable IAP formulation and thus uh, higher decision quality and better assurance. Next couple of examples, these are not capital projects at all. Uh, the top one is one of my own. This is when I first joined the NDA and I was in charge of the assurance function, I used framing to shape what I wanted to do to the assurance function. That's framing as applied to an organization function. And this is what the frame, the full frame for framing looks like. So a little project introduced framing into the NDA, you can frame that. And if you do, this is what the frame looks like for that. Now some more traditional examples. This is a logical program, again, not a capital program, but it is a multi-billion dollar cost saving program being rolled out across the NDA estate. This was done at inception, and as you can see, the frame works very, very well, 
even for projects that aren't capital projects matured according to uh, the, the ways that we're so so familiar with and these are the more traditional varieties so this is a capital project this is a new build let's build a new vault uh, and this is what a frame looks like uh, for that uh, I think one of the things you can you can say I'll tell you one thing about this project it was approaching OBC when we did the framing and we were actually doing the frame for getting from OBC to FBC i.e getting from single concept to like to final investment decision now you might think that by the time a project's got to that stage it doesn't actually have many decisions you left to make well you'd be wrong because this is how many decisions that project still had to make even though it was approaching OBC so I show you this just to demonstrate why framing is still valuable even later on during front-end loading similar example here this is a new vault uh, uh, in the NDA estate same story same stage still a lot of decisions to be made even though it was a completely different project so it wasn't it wasn't just the project that was unusual and hadn't made enough decisions it's just all projects at this stage still have a lot of decisions and shaping still to be done final fly, final final um, uh, slide just to return to the original graphic where I showed the root causes of project failure I'm not going to read this out but all I'm going to say is that I put on here in green the extent to which I think that opportunity framing helps uh, with solving some of these root causes of project failure and as you can see there isn't any aspect of root cause of project failure that I, that I can't see opportunity framing helping with so that's what I what I put to you that it is a holistic tool and now I'd like to hand back to the chair that's the end of my presentation and we'll ask you some more questions about what you think Robert, are you on mute? I am on the mute. I, I must have uh, tricked myself by turning on the light. I realized I was in the dark talking to you last time, so I've turned the light on and now forgot to unmute. But um, great session, Cole, thank you. I've just put the poll up um, and I can see some people are getting involved. Um, and the question is, which statement best describes your thinking? Um, at the minute we're on 100%. Uh, we're slowly getting through some for the other options as well. So I'll let this run for a little bit longer. As I say, we've got over 100 people with us um, and we're quickly yeah. climbing in the numbers. Just about to hit the reason I asked the question is um, there's, uh, it, it was often put to me at the start of rolling out uh, opportunity framing. Does this actually have anything new? If we're going to introduce opportunity framing, what else should we stop? And my answer was, well, you don't need to stop anything because it's additive. It's going to add something that you weren't previously doing that you should have been doing. So it looks like the audience is, uh, is agreeing with that. Perfect. On that note, I'll move on to the next question, um, which hopefully pops up. Which statement best describes your thoughts for the future? And again, I'll, I'll leave that to run for a bit. Yeah, so the, the first question is, would you like IPA to make this available? If you, if, if you do, I can go and twist their arm. I'm not sure they'll say yes, but we can always try. But if not, I was wondering whether an institution like the APM might be interested in crafting a public domain version of opportunity framing. I don't believe there is a public domain version. I think they're all proprietary, open by the boutiques, but it's nice to have a, an open source version, and maybe APM could, could do that yeah excellent so what well, let that run again we're getting some good results here so thank you everyone for getting involved um and i can definitely see that there's a, a lot of questions waiting for you so um what's, what would you prefer should i leave this poll just start running in the background and, and dive into the questions yes absolutely no reason why not Perfect. So my first question is from Catherine, who says, noting that you have ruled out facilitation of framing events by anyone other than a trained expert facilitator. What is the worst that could happen if a project team tried it out themselves? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. I, I, I don't think you could damage a project by uh, doing project by doing framing badly. I think you'd always add value by doing it even if inexpertly but you wouldn't add the value 
right? So the, the cost of doing it badly is the lost opportunity cost of not driving yourself up that value curve that we showed with the eagle's beak. Um, I think framing, I have seen framing done badly. It was a boutique consultancy, actually. You should have known better. They shall remain nameless, and it's not one I mentioned earlier. Uh, but they did framing badly for a project that I then did framing for. The pro look on the project manager's face when he showed me the, their strategy table, he just didn't really know what to do with it. It was, it, was, it was useless. So it really wasted his time. The damage it had done, other than wasting his time, is it damaged the brand of opportunity framing. It had persuaded him, semi-persuaded him, opportunity framing wasn't adding the value. But if done expertly, and we only in the NDA and only in the IPA, put framing into the hands of expert facilitators. If done well, it can add a huge amount of value. If done badly, it just won't add the value and waste everybody's time. Excellent, thank you. And I'm sure that helps answer the question. So um, there's a lovely comment come through from Ram who says, what a great webinar, thank you. So I'll just share that very quickly. And then I'll move into Alex's question uh, who asks, are the cost overruns beyond the P80 risk measure? Oh, the cost yeah. runs that I was talking about earlier? Yes. Well, yes. I mean, by definition, <laughs> I think. Uh, I mean, all of the slides that I was showing earlier on the, the good, the bad, and the ugly slide uh, were, were points that ran out to P80s. Uh, and in our experience, the vast majority, we have some examples of projects coming in within P80 and improving even on P50, but the vast majority in civil nuclear, not just in this country, but abroad, go way over the P80. That's what I mean. When I when I say it comes in at three times the original price, it comes in at, uh, you know, not even a, P, a P100. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the points uh, the estimates that, that we get when we do QRA on them, they don't even plot on the curve. The cost estimates that, that people, that, 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 that we get are, are less than P0. You know, they have zero chance of, of being realized. Schedule two. Uh, and, and framing helps fix that. Uh, how? Uh, it helps uh, fix it by making sure all the option space is explored and that there is high decision quality because a lot of the delays arise because of project recycle, right? It's realized too late in the game. Oh, the cost's that? Well, if I knew the cost was that, I would have done this other thing, right? So, uh, you know, high quality decision, high, good decision quality in and of itself uh, gives greater certainty around cost and schedule outcomes. Excellent, thank you. Um, Ashok has asked a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, he said, really enjoyed it. Um, I'd like to learn more about this method. Where can I find more information? Are there any books? Um, and then he books? shared. The <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately not. I've looked. <laughs> I mean, the value of front end loading, I mean, that's very well known. And guys like Ed Merrow, uh, IPA Global, were, are writing about that sort of thing uh, publicly. Um, I would refer everyone to a paper that is about to be presented at the WM the Waste Management Symposium, Phoenix in Arizona, uh, in just a couple of weeks' time. It'll be in the public domain soon, if not already, and it's a paper I wrote on opportunity framing. And as far as I'm aware, it's, 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 the, it's the only thing that's really written up on what the pros are, but I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any books that are out there. There are, of course, many guides to opportunity framing that uh, consultancies will, will sell to you, but like I say, they're all proprietary, but nothing in the public domain. If you work for the government, uh, you will be able to approach the IPA and they will give you uh, a, a kind of pre-issue version of the uh, framing method and that will explain, explain it. It's, it's a good 80 pages, so that's effectively a book. Um, but but outside of that, no, I'm not aware of anything in the public domain. Excellent, thank you. And I should if anybody you is your... aware, they can bring it to my attention. I'd be delighted. <laughs> yeah, please post away in your questions box, and I'll feed it through. Um, Colin has asked. I see lessons learned is not part of the framing session process. I see lessons learned as a key input into framing. Do you have any view on this? Lessons learned. Well, I think that lessons learned is uh, is an important part of, of front end loading. There are many things that one does during project stage. Uh, what framing is, 
uh, if you remember the, the slide which I showed that showed that it start it, it happens right at the start of a stage well it's kind of the first thing that you do and you brainstorm a lot of stuff like stakeholders and risks but it, it just because we're brainstorming stakeholders doesn't mean it's stakeholder analysis right so it, it, it precedes a lot of things that the projects then go out to to flesh out in more detail. Just because there's a risks brainstorming piece doesn't mean that's the risks log. There's a whole risk management process which will turn that into you know the the bow ties and all the rest of it. Similarly, on lessons learned, this isn't a lessons learned exercise, but lessons learned would obviously follow follow on on from it. So I'm not trying to demean lessons learned by not having it on there, but it, it's not part of this process because this is literally the first thing you do uh, in in the stage and then a lot of other things happen I would imagine that in the in the formulation of an IAP you would say all sorts of things like thou shalt do value improving practices such as design to capacity constructability workshops lessons learned workshops so in a way I see lessons learned fitting in there as, as part of being demanded by what the IAP wants excellent and um, Colin thank you for your question uh, Tom has asked, what size of organization do you think framing would be useful for? This appears to fit well for large organizations, uh, but Tom's struggling to see how it might be applied in SMEs. I think what you'd struggle to apply in SMEs is finding a trained facilitator. Because uh, uh, you know, if you imagine putting a workshop together, it's not going to cost 50 pence. It's going to cost a bit to buy this in. So uh, I, I think it does apply. It can be used at SMEs. The problem would be uh, having the uh, the trained facilitators and a method uh, uh, available. And that's why I'm so interested in the IPM crafting something uh, for that space. What I would say is that framing is useful for anything and everything. When I was at, working at Chevron, uh, tools like this would automatically come up in conversation around the coffee table and you would apply framing tools such as the strategy table and I have personally applied it myself to choosing my daughter's schools. I have applied the strategy table concept to choosing which car I'm going to buy next. So there are aspects of framing which are so powerful and useful that when you get into the habit of using them, you use them for absolutely everything, not just medium-sized projects in SMEs, but absolutely everything. And it just comes up in the course of conversation. Uh, so that is the case at companies like Chevron. I think it would be a while before we got this moved into the SME space because it takes, it takes a lot of training to get your head around uh, some of the concepts. And like I say, the training facilitation will be hard to deploy into, into that sector initially, but we'll get there. Thank you. And Tom, thank you for your question. Uh, David's asked, can you quantify the benefits of opportune framing in monetary terms? Monetary terms? Well, I can try for the NDA. I wouldn't put it on a slide, but I'll tell you guys face to face. I mean, our bill for decommissioning in the UK is nominally £135 uh, billion pounds over the next 20 years. Uh, oil and gas, UK continental shelf, similar numbers, just under 50. Uh, so these are big decommissioning bills. Um, in the civil nuclear space, if you believe that number, <laughs> which I don't, right? Because if you imagine that, that what the NAO is, say, the National Audit Office say about us is true, and all of those, the ugly slides, all of our projects look like that, and all of our cost estimates go, going up. Well, that 135 could be could be anything, right? I mean, we put a, a range in our annual report that it could be from this to this. And I can't remember what the big number is, but it's something of the order of a quarter, a third of a trillion, not a pound, right, of taxpayers' money. So uh, with that range of uncertainty, what I say about framing is framing could save a bunch of that, right? I would, you know, I would put my, 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 my money where my mouth is and say it's going to save the UK taxpayer tens, if not hundreds of billions of pounds just in civil nuclear decommissioning alone, if applied properly and fully and holistically across all of the NDA's estate, because it will make project maturation that much smoother. It is one of the reasons why, even though I'm the head of cross-industry learning, and there is a lot to be learned between our industry and other industries, 
this is the one particular thing that I wanted to make absolutely sure the NDA estate learned from oil and gas, because this is the best thing that we can learn. It is the most impactful thing in terms of money saving uh, to the UK taxpayer that our estate uh, can do by adopting this process. That, that's how I would put it. So the, the savings in the billions, tens of billions, maybe hundreds of billions to us alone. Wow. Thank, thank you, David, for the, the question. Um, Zara has said, I see some commonality with the HM Treasury five case model and the process of getting from the long list to the short list. But this adds the tools to the process to exploring the preferred way forward. That's absolutely right. The Green Book uh, uh, explains uh, what the government's methodology is. It's, it's essentially a methodological statement. It says you, you should do this and, and this is your stage gate uh, constrained cri criteria by SOC I want to see X uh, and then the blue book tells you how to write the business case uh, so so yeah this is absolutely consistent with that what green book doesn't tell you is how to do it <laughs> though uh, green book is it, it tells you how to write the business case at the end of the stage green and blue books together it doesn't tell you how to kick off the stage uh, that's really what's been going on this last year. When we came up with, the, the IPA came up with the Opportunity Framing Guide, and it was March last year that it was already written. They've been going through the process in the intermediate uh, uh, time of making sure that it is consistent with what Green Book and Blue Book and things like IPA's root map process and other such processes say. So that's been the delay in getting the thing out, making sure the things line up. But they do line up, and your questioner is absolutely right. This is the tool which uh, Green Book is uh, essentially asking you to use, although it didn't know it at the time. Thanks. Thank you, Zara, for your question. Um, Ashok has said, is there a single sentence you can use to define framing? like we do with program or project? Oh yes, well there is actually an opportunity statement but I don't have it to hand and I can't remember it. Uh, a, sim a simple statement, well I, th I think it, <clears throat> I, I would say this, that it is a tool that supports uh, optioneering and it is a tool that ensures stakeholder alignment uh, to make sure that by the time you approach a decision gate or a decision point, uh, you have high decision quality. Um, you can rearrange those words, but those are essentially the kind of words that I would have in an opportunity statement for framing. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Alex has asked, uh, is the crux of opportunity framing basically allowing a good chunk of time at the start of a project or project phase rather than just launching into it? How do you approach this when a project is under very tight time scales and is operating <laughs> on a JFDI basis? Yeah, well, read what Ed Merrow's got to say about how, how much of a killer to projects being schedule driven is, particularly to mega projects. If you're in that state, then you're already in really big trouble. Now, obviously, some of our projects are already in that state for, for, for well, that's just the way the cards landed. I mean, for us in the civil nuclear estate, it is no secret that at Sellafield we have some high hazards. And these are high hazards which have been left for us by previous generations that we now have to deal with, with some, some sense of urgency. So we have some schedule driven projects within our estate. But just because you're schedule driven is no excuse to just fly in there and make a mess of your project maturation. There is always time to take two days out and do some framing, right? I mean, if you're looking at a potential one year, five year, 10 year delay, from doing it wrong, what is the problem anybody would have with taking two days out to pause, do some proper framing before proceeding? Nobody should have a problem with that. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Alex, for your question. Edwards asked, um, who do we need to ask at the IPA for a draft version of the opportunity framing guide? <laughs> well, I'm not sure I want to give out a name because I don't want it to be flooded with emails. You can ask me in the first instance and I'll uh, see see what we can do. It depends who you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, Edward, it is worth, worth uh, posing the question. Um, and then Alice has said, and it kind of touches on what you said earlier about the organisations and SMEs, but um, how could you go about introducing opportunity framing into her organisation or an organisation on the whole? 
into an organization well it's going to be real easy if you are part of the uk government's estate a uh, non-departmental body or a department because you just approach the ipa and they'll work with you as they're working uh, with 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 me um, if you are in the private sector uh, and you want to introduce framing then you should probably do it in pilot mode uh, don't don't just slap something in because uh, as I showed in my frame for framing kind of slides, it's something you have to design and craft to your organization. One size does not fit all. Uh, so, so, uh, but there are plenty of boutiques out there or big consultancies that will help you. And some of those consultancies will, will provide the service, will either design you a service or, or will provide you that service. Some of these, some of these practitioners are, are very skilled at this. I mean, some of them, I don't want to name any names, but some of these practitioners were, were there at the invention. They, they helped create it. It wasn't invented by owner operators necessarily. It was a process that was co-invented, co-created between the supply chain, between the tier one uh, consultancies and engineering houses and the owner operators uh, back then. So a lot of them are very well placed to, to, advise, you, uh, to advise you on it. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Alice, for your, your question. And, and I'm, I'm looking at my question box and I'm, I'm all out of questions. Um, there's certainly some nice comments coming through, people taking the time to say thank you for answering their questions. Oh, uh, Ed's just come in with a question. Uh, so I'll, I'll pose this one to you and we'll, we'll call this the final one. Um, Ed has said, is it a good idea to try and implement this in an, an environment with a relatively low level of PD maturity? PD? Project director. Um, it just says PD, unfortunately. Um, Ed, are you able to expand on PD for us? Uh, yeah. Well, if the question, if the question is if my decision makers are rubbish, uh, is there any point in introducing framing? Um, well, yes. I'm not going to say anything about the decision makers I'm familiar with. Uh, but uh, this helps decision makers, including, it helps project managers, obviously, but it also helps decision makers understand what the project's about. Uh, so framing helps decision makers as much as it does the project. And as such, the decision makers can be uh, of a second quality and yet still benefit from framing of course if they weren't of the first quality they wouldn't know to ask for it in the first place but you can always put 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 them up to it but you know this framing that there is a reason we chose this among all of the things we could have chosen from the project management tool sets that are out there that we could have learned from other industries there's a reason we picked out opportunity framing because it has such a wide impact right and that that effect it has on aligning stakeholders includes stakeholders all the way up to chain up the chain you know we, we 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 have in our framing workshops not just the project director and his senior responsible officer the sro or decision executive or whatever it's called in your industry but we also have the bays governmental representatives we have the regulators involved right in an oil and gas industry uh, you you'd involve joint venture partners in the framing exercise i mean framing is an exercise which goes all the way up the decision tree and involves all decision makers it should involve all decision makers in the exercise in the two day event uh, itself and as such it helps train your decision makers thus if they're not so good to start with framing is a good way of making them better Excellent. Work. Excellent. Thank you. I'm just going to literally spend 10 seconds just reading out these lovely comments that have come through. Um, Sarah said, thank you very much. Mark has said, a very thought-provoking discussion, and I fully support the need for framing. Great presentation. David has said, thank you for your time today. A very insightful presentation. Darren has said, thank you. Would love to get hold of something from IPA. Uh, impressed with your knowledge and clear view, which you have been kind enough to share with us tonight. Um, so they're just some of the nice comments that have come through and, and really I'd just like to echo that Cole and just say thank you for your time and your knowledge this evening um, it's, it's been a really great event so thank you well, thanks thanks for the opportunity not a problem um, I'd also like to say thank you for everyone who joined us this evening uh, and also took the time to get involved in the polls 
Um, as I said, we will send a, a copy of the recording and the slides to you within the next 24 hours. Uh, please go to the APM YouTube channel as well. There's a whole host of content there as well. Um, and also keep an eye on the event listing page. We've got a lot of face-to-face -face events coming back in your local community. Uh, I know there's one taking place in Cumbria uh, in the coming months around the value of assurance. So get along to that. Network again with your community peers uh, and we look forward to seeing you there. But most importantly, keep well and thanks again for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your evening and bye for now.